Good evening, film fans, and welcome once again with thanks to the very kind people who support this channel on Patreon, people like David Sullivan and Hunter Hayes. I am talking about Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the indie film that it was commonplace to hate on back in the day, and now it's become something of a hot take to say that you love it. Now, I'm old enough to remember a time when Indiana Jones was a mere trilogy of films, and yeah, Temple of Doom was the one that was often ranked the lowest. It's the one that people didn't really like, and it's kind of easy to see why at a glance it's a very different beast to the other two, leaning much more into comedy and horror, and this was very much a conscious decision. Producer and story developer George Lucas is very open about this fact in the behind the scenes material. The story ended up, for whatever reason, uh, turned a lot darker, I think. We decided to go darker. Uh, part of it, I guess, as I was going through a divorce at the time and I wasn't in a good mood. At least he's honest about it, and yeah, personal life stuff can affect anyone's work. It just so happens to be that most of us don't have $30 million in an A-list cast and crew to explore those ideas. Speaking of which, keep an eye out on this channel for the telltale signs of me ever potentially going through a divorce. I just think Moonraker's really overrated, in all honesty. But everyone must have been on board with Lucas's darker take, as this vision permeates the entire thing. Steven Spielberg is back as director, of course, and he's certainly no stranger to horror elements, but it's cool that everyone seemed to be on the same page creatively, despite this being an incredibly different initial footing to the previous indie adventure. And I kind of marvel at how brave they were to fully commit something that would presumably be defying all expectations for what an indie sequel would be. It's also notable for not featuring any returning characters from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, this is partly due to the fact that the film takes place before Raiders. It's a prequel, and the film's locations take us nowhere near Indy's home, but as a kid watching this, and even as an adult, really, for a good while, I never caught that this was actually supposed to be a prequel, and I honestly don't think it matters. Lucas talks about how this was done to avoid having Nazis as the bad guys, but I always just took this as a very James Bond thing. I, every film has Bond in different locations with a new villain and a new Bond girl, and this follows that same format. There's even something of an extended pre-story adventure. Uh, the first 20 minutes or so of the film are kind of rambling, but also an awful lot of fun as things begin in Shanghai, with Indy at the tail end of a previous mission before being whisked off to India, along with his young sidekick Short Round and a nightclub singer named Willie Scott, who is just apparently fine to go along for the ride. Initially, at least. It's all a little strange, but we'll talk about it in a bit, because the bulk of the film concerns the trio assisting a forlorn village retrieve its sacred stone and children, which were taken by evil forces believed to be based in or around the nearby Pancot Palace. Once the trio get to the location, it's an awful lot of haunted house, demonic practice, and minecart fun shenanigans as they attempt to free the captive children and return the village to its former glory by retrieving the Holy Stone. As with its predecessor, the influences are apparent right off the bat as things open with a huge Busby Berkeley-style musical number. I'm immediately thinking of 1930s Hollywood, which is totally what Spielberg is going for, and when all the horror antics start kicking off later on, I'm thinking of the likes of The Old Dark House, and the Black Cat. I like that the influences are all of the same time period as Raiders, just shifting genre a bit, and once again Spielberg totally nails it. The first 20 minutes of the film are a real whirlwind. Indy himself makes a very Bondian entrance into proceedings with a very Goldfinger-style white tux, and all the stuff in Shanghai is really terrific. Indy is poisoned, and the antidote is getting knocked about all over the place, and he's going for that, while Willie is similarly scrambling around on the floor for a massive diamond that gets lost. It's also darkly comedic, but really, really fun. A few to a Kill's very own David Yip appears as a quickly offed ally before Indy escapes with Willie into the car of Short Round, who zips them off to an aeroplane to get out of Shanghai. This whole mini-adventure seems entirely constructed to get the three principal heroes of the film together and quite randomly have them end up in just the right spot in rural India for the plot to take place. It may seem incredibly contrived, and there's some lip service given to supernatural involvement, destiny and fate, and all that, but I do just adore the breakneck pace at which we do get into things. It's common for Indiana Jones to have allies along on a mission with him, but the general consensus on Willie and Short Round is that they're kind of annoying, and sure, Willie does nothing but over-the-top shrieking for half of her screen time, and Short Round is obviously there to appeal to kids. Those are common criticisms about these characters, and it's hard to disagree with either of them. But neither bother me at all. In fact, I think they're both great assets to the film. Kate Capshaw plays Willie, and throughout, I think she's a terrific comedic actress and has a really fun energy. Once they get to the village and Indy decides to go on this mission, they follow him, and there are a load of antics with her having issues at 
adapting to this new life she finds herself living in, and I think she's great. What I've never understood, though, is just how she ends up going along on this adventure in the first place. She's a performer in Shanghai and has definitely gotten herself in with a bad bunch of blokes, but Indy very much just kind of drags her along and onto the plane, which seems a bit much and not something that either of them are going to benefit from all that much initially. I mean, they've only just met. I don't get the sense that she's in a life-or-death situation like he is, so I don't really know why she's dragged along. I guess they keep it deliberately brief, and the pace the thing moves at, it is just kind of fine to just roll with it. Short Round is played by Jonathan K. Kwan, and yeah, sure, he's here to appeal to the kid audience, but you know what? That worked for me when I was a kid. I love that he was going along on this adventure with Indy, and the three of them formed this kind of surrogate family unit, and that certainly resonated a lot with me as a kid. This was definitely the indie film that I watched most as a kid, like with those three terrific leads and the breakneck pace, I think it's actually pretty good for kids were it not for the satanic ritual stuff. And yes, once the trip through the jungle is over and the heroes arrive at the palace, the tone shifts quite a bit. Don't get me wrong, there's still an awful lot of comedy to be had, but it's certainly dark comedy. There's the famous dinner sequence, which seems to one-up a similar sequence in Octopussy, where the heroes are served a selection of particularly unappealing courses. It's one of the most memorable and iconic scenes in the film, and it's a highlight for me too. A lot of what we see is truly disgusting, but it's all interspersed with some story exposition as Indy hobnobs with a few dignitaries staying at the palace. Another of my favourite scenes follows on from that, where Indy and Willie are suddenly really quite hot for each other, and they're both waiting in their own rooms for the other one to crack and come running into their room first, and again, there's a 1930s, like, screwball comedy bent to this that I just love. It feels like such a throwback, and particularly after Indy realises that they're both in danger and he's searching around her room for potential assailants, I just love all the comedy they get out of this. Oh, Indy. Oh, be gentle with me. Oh, be gentle with me. Following on from that is my favourite sequence in the whole film, as Indian Short Round are trapped in this room with spikes in the floor and ceiling, and the room is slowly caving in and Willie has to face all these bugs to save them. It's a masterclass of a scene for just suspense, comedy, and general ickiness. It's funny and exciting in equal measures. I love a rough, tough adventurer like Indy having to deal with someone like Willie along for an adventure. There's a nice odd couple dynamic, and Short Round adds his own sassiness to proceedings. These three sequences in succession are just my absolute absolute highlight of the film and I really adore it. The hour mark is really where things take a different turn though and some of the comedy is kind of dialed back and for the next 45 minutes of the film we spend most of it in this satanic chamber watching all of these rituals. It quickly becomes apparent that this cult is using the sacred stone for its own nefarious purposes and the village children have been abducted and forced to work in a mine. This whole chunk of the film is really focused on these rituals and Indy has turned into a bad guy at one point providing short round his big hero moment as he intervenes to bring Indy back to his senses. These are probably the sequences most synonymous with the film in the minds of moviegoers along with the dinner scene, and they're certainly memorable, and I have no issue with them in concept, but in practice I feel like they maybe just go on a little bit too long and all of the chanting gets a bit repetitive, but really my main issue with this chunk of the film is just that I feel like we're missing a really solid main villain in this film. Now, I don't want to take away anything from the brilliant work that Amrish Puri is contributing here as Mola Ram. Certainly the character I'd identify as the film's main villain and the one iconic enough to be included on posters and the like, but I don't know, I just feel like someone somewhere should have had other motives at play were introduced to a bunch of characters at the dinner scene, including the Prime Minister of Pankot, a British captain, and a young Maharaja, and each of these characters plays a, a role later in the story, a small role, but it feels like this is some kind of setup for maybe one or two of these being the true masterminds of the whole thing, and it never comes. But as is, Mola Ram is the main guy, and he's got the kids at work to find more sacred stones, because if he gets them all, he can bring about the reign of Kali, and while this would no doubt be terrible for everyone, I don't know, the stakes just feel less immediate and clear than Raiders, where, like, Nazis want to harness the power of God is so instantly gettable, and here, I, 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 here I'm majorly nitpicking, but the bigger picture of what Mola Ram is up to doesn't feel all that clear or tangible to me. It feels like so much of his evil is confined to, to this chamber. The most horrific images of the film take place within these sequences. A guy literally has his heart ripped out of his chest, and I was stunned when I eventually saw these shots included on the film's Blu-ray. These were never on the UK VHS or even the DVD here, due to, I guess, Paramount wanted to keep the films as PG-rated on those formats here, but finally the unreleased version was released as a 
12 on Blu-ray. After all the sacrifice stuff, Indy is returned to being a good guy, and again, once the pace kicks up, it doesn't stop for the last half hour of the thing. It's a huge chase as Indy, Willie, and Short Round escape and free the captive kids, and there's this fun as hell minecart chase, which I just love, and especially as a kid, I was so desperate to be on this ride. I've always loved the moment too at the end of the chase where the characters make it out into daylight and you really feel the same relief as the characters in a good way. Like up until that point the characters haven't seen daylight or we the audience haven't seen daylight in over an hour of screen time. The scenes in the mine and the temple do really well to create such a claustrophobic vibe and when the characters finally emerge I feel like I'm finally letting go of my breath <laughs> along with them and only then do I realize that this almost subconscious claustrophobic feeling that the film has given me watching all of those previous scenes. The climax on the rope bridge is wonderful. Some of the effects are a little dated, but the dangers just keep piling on each other. It's a really fun climax, and of course we end with Indy and Willie kissing and short round grossed out, and while I never get the sense that Indy and Willie would become a permanent item, it is a satisfying conclusion. I'm annoyed that the general perception of this as being a lesser indie film has sort of permeated my adult brain so much. Like, if I'm in the mood for an indie film, I'll pick either Raiders or Last Crusade, and very seldom will I go for Temple of Doom, but I had such a blast with it on this viewing for the purpose of this review that that's gonna change. This was the indie film I watched the most when I was a kid. I wore down my dad's VHS of it, and on revisiting it for the first time in quite a while, I think a big part of that is down to the breakneck pace this thing runs at, and when the pace does slow down, it's giving you all kinds of terrifying and intriguing visuals to look at. It never lets up, and maybe some people would find that exhausting, but even now as an adult, I really dig it. Marrying this with a trio of really funny, charismatic leads, and I have a great time with this film. I think we're past the hot take opinion stage of Temple of Doom now. I feel like there are a good chunk of people out there who are very vocal about their love for it, and I love it just as much as they do. I was surprised checking actually on Letterboxd after watching the film just how strong a rating it had. I guess Crystal Skull probably did wonders for this film's reputation, but if you haven't seen Temple of Doom in a good long while, it might be time to crack out that DVD or Blu-ray and give it another whirl. Let me know your thoughts on this one in the comments section below. I'd like to see if there is much of a consensus as to whether or not public opinion has really changed. Like I say, like I feel like it's a bit of a hot take to say that you actually really like this one these days, and I see articles saying like, why Temple of Doom is actually the best in Indiana Jones film, and I'm not going to quite go that far, but I do think that there's an awful lot to enjoy, and maybe a big part of that is childhood nostalgia, and maybe that is for you, but I think that's a perfectly valid excuse to like something, so please do let me know your thoughts below. Also below, you can find links to my various social media pages, including my Facebook page, my Twitter page, and my Patreon page. If you want to join the people who vote on the polls to decide what non-Bond movie reviews I upload on this channel, so please do head over to that site for more info there, and with all that being said, so long for now, movie fans.